for this next session of the Covering Rare Diseases Fellowship Program, we're going to be learning about the NIH Undiagnosed no. Network and how researchers like Dr. William Gall are expanding the boundaries of what we know about rare disease. Dr. Gall is a senior investigator with the Medical Genetics Branch at NIH. Thank you for joining us, and please take us on that journey, Dr. Gall. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. I appreciate this opportunity. And I think you can probably see a painting by Luke Fildes, which is called uh, The Doctor. And this portrays how difficult it is when someone has uncertainty over a diagnosis or a treatment. And that's what the Undiagnosed Disease Program addresses. So this is a program that is run <clears throat> at the National Institutes of Health. And there are all these people that I, I have to thank. Uh, Dr. Tift, head of pediatrics, head of bioinformatics is Dr. Adams. Dr. Toro is our chief neurologist. And we've had enormous support from NHGRI, the institute that I work in, the Office of Rare Disease Research, and the clinical center here, as well as the office of the director, and a lot of different consultants. This is our group recently. And the Undiagnosed Disease Program was established in 2008 by Dr. Elias Zerhouni with a little bit of money from the Office of Rare Diseases. And Dr. Zerhouni provided money for the first three years, and then it was supported by the Common Fund as a national program called the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. The goals were to help patients reach a diagnosis when they had a difficult uh, time to do that, and also to discover new diseases and new insights into cell biology and genetics, et cetera. The way it works is that applicants will submit their medical records with a referring physician's letter. And then I look at the medical records for the adults and Dr. Tift for the children. And we have them reviewed by intramural investigators who are experts. Um, we make the final decision and accept probably about a third or 40% uh, or so of those who apply. And if accepted, the patients come to us at the clinical center here, which is our hospital for a one week stay. This is a picture of us in the early years going over a lot of the medical records of these individuals. who And the patients are referred from many different major medical centers around the country. We do customized phenotyping. So we uh, do a really good workup of the individuals. Then we do genetic testing, so which can be commercial or SNP arrays. I'll tell you about that in a minute or exome and genome sequencing, also some functional studies. And over the first 11 years or so, we reviewed over 4,000 medical records and saw over 1,200 individuals, a lot of kids, a lot of neurology cases, a bunch of SNP chips, exomes, and we made over 300 diagnoses and had a lot of publications, which basically allowed us to continue to be funded by the NIH. Since then, 2019 to 2022, we've had a commensurate number of individuals seen and accepted and diagnosed. So I'm just gonna go through very rapidly a list of some of the diagnoses we've made here. And I'm probably not even gonna give you time to read all of these because there are probably about a dozen or so of these slides. But the point is that these are very unusual diagnoses and they're very rare. You can see five in the world at the time, six families in the world, only 20 families in the world with this, because these patients are referred from other major medical centers that have been unable to make a diagnosis. And some of these are actually new diseases. So these are unusual enough that when I give a talk to geneticists who know a lot of the genetic diseases that these represent, I tell them that if they know all of the diseases on these lists, they really need to get a life. They need to get out a little bit more, maybe have dinner with their spouse or loved ones, things like that, because these really are very unusual disorders. And uh, I think I'm just about done with these. Yeah, and these are, uh, this is a list of the new disease gene associations that we've made <clears throat> um, over the years. So I guess so at 24, and there are actually a few more. Uh, these are diseases that were not previously known and were discovered by virtue of patients coming to the NIH 
for the undiagnosed disease program. And they're an additional list for those who came to other UDN centers, undiagnosed disease network centers. Another thing that we do is train young individuals. And these are some of those at one of our rounds is on Thursday mornings, we have uh, rounds for an hour where we present patients about half or two thirds of the time. Otherwise we have didactic sessions, but it's based upon the undiagnosed disease program individuals. And a lot of publications, if this is uh, how we get credit, including in very high impact journals like the ones mentioned here, we've also given a lot of talks about this and have interactions with uh, Congress people who send us inquiries and we respond to those inquiries, et cetera. Some visits as well. <clears throat> so this is a talk in which I give some facts and some numbers, and then I tell some stories about patients. And the stories are really much more interesting than the facts and numbers. So here's a, a case of five siblings from the Kentucky region who all had the findings of claudication, so pain because of vascular insufficiency in their lower extremities <clears throat> with uh, joint pain in their hands as well. And they had calcifications. So this is a plain film. There's no dye here. That's all calcium in these vessels, the femoral artery and the popliteal artery here on both sides. And here it is in the AP view. And here it is the dorsalis pedis in the foot. And here is a little calcification around the um, metacarpal phalangeal joints, et cetera. So there's ectopic calcification, it doesn't belong there. And I have to explain to you what the single nucleotide polymorphisms are to show how we made the diagnosis of this new disease. Single nucleotide polymorphisms are uh, bases that have two possibilities. It can be either an A and a T or a C and a G. And these are scattered all throughout our genome of 3 billion bases. Well, scientists were able to pick out about a million out of those 3 billion, about a million polymorphisms where the two possibilities were about 50-50. They could have been 70-30 or even 80-20 or something of that sort, but about even. And they're able to determine if someone has uh, two copies of this, two copies of this, or one copy of each. Because remember, we all have two copies of uh, each of our genes, just about, except for the X's and Y's in some people. So this is the one that's polymorphic. It can be either this or this. And we're able to determine which it is for each of those two copies in a certain way, basically by using fluorescence. And I'll show you that. The more frequent of the two alleles is called the A allele, and the less frequent is called the B allele. So because we have two copies, we're all gonna either be AA, BB, or AB. And you can tell that by the degree of the specific hybridization that tells you if this is B or A, because we've attached fluorescence to the Bs and a different fluorescence to the As. Or you could have AB, or you could have just one of those. Now, if you were to take a plot all of those polymorphisms, a million of them <clears throat> on a um, graph, you would see each of those, these blue dots is one of those polymorphic bases. And so these are all BBs, these are all homozygous AAs, and these are the heterozygotes. And each of these blue dots is about 3000 bases apart because they're 1 million out of 3 billion. So now if you take just this middle line here and look at the five individuals who had the disease, all the siblings, et cetera, and you're only looking at the ABs, only the heterozygotes here, you have the parents here, the parents here, and for each of these five affected siblings, this is one region in which everyone is homozygous. They either have AA or BB. And what that means is, and the reason is because their parents were third cousins. First cousins share one eighth of their genes, second cousins share one thirty second of their genes, third cousins share one one hundred twenty eighth of their genes. And this is the one region in their entire genome in which all five affected siblings or children had, were completely homozygous, meaning they shared all of their genes in this region. 
That means that if there's a mutation in this region, it's going to be homozygous. They're both copies are going to be affected with that mutation. Well, it turns out this is a region of 22 million bases, the 20, 92 genes. One of the genes was a really good candidate, and that was NT5E, which encodes CD73, an enzyme that convert, converts adenosyl monophosphate to adenosine and inorganic phosphate. And we found that these five individuals, one, two, three, four, five, all had a mutation in both copies of their NT5E gene. We then found another family that had three affected individuals and another that had one affected individuals. So we had, what, nine individuals in three families that had both copies of this gene knocked out. And we got skin biopsies to grow the fibroblasts, which are some of their skin cells, and found that this enzyme had activity that was much, much lower in the fibroblasts of these individuals compared to normal. And you can see that here, there's a, a phenotype associated with that too. So the uh, fibroblasts of the affected individual had more alkaline phosphatase and it stains here in the affected compared to the control. I'll just show you the next slide shows that there's also increased calcium and that's the red stain here. Calcium in the affected compared to the controls and that you could treat it and you could treat it with adenosine which is the product of the enzyme that's missing, or levamisol, which is an inhibitor of alkaline phosphatase. So this all comes together with this explanation. CD73 is missing, and normally CD73 converts AMP to adenosine, and normally adenosine interacts with adenosine receptors on the surface of the vascular cells, of the blood vessels. And that uh, interaction causes this tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase normally to be repressed. In the case of this uh, disorder, you don't have enough CD73, you don't have the repression of tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase. And ordinarily, the alkaline phosphatase will convert, <clears throat> will, um, the, the alkaline phosphatase converts uh, pyrophosphate to inorganic phosphate. This inhibits the calcification. And when you have too much alkaline phosphatase, it converts the pyrophosphate to inorganic phosphate and stimulates the mineralization or the calcification. And that's why these individuals have this new disease. Now I'll give you a, a few other examples of individuals that we saw here. This is a 25 year old man who had all sorts of ulcerations uh, with a susceptibility then to infections in his skin. His chest was relatively spared, but his legs and his arms were um, terribly affected. And underneath the skin, there was calcium. You could see that on a CT scan that, that we did. <clears throat> well, we got a bunch of consultants to see this man. And one of them was Dr. Lisa Ryder in rheumatology. And she said, I don't really know the basis of this, but I can suggest that you treat with sodium thiosulfate. Why is that? It's because the calcium was a product of inflammation, but it was also a cause of inflammation. So there was a vicious cycle. And if you could reduce the calcification, you might be able to reduce the inflammation and the ulcerations of his skin. The reason being that the thiosulfate salt is much more soluble than the phosphate salt of calcium. So this was uh, what it was after a month or so, and it just looks like a burn. So treated with this with sodium, sodium thiosulfate, and you can see that after four months, he's got skin back and it's reasonable looking skin. So this is a case where at the time we didn't have the diagnosis, we didn't know the gene that was causing it, but there was symptomatic treatment by virtue of having seen a, one of the um, experts here at the NIH. Here's another case of a 65-year-old man who had recurrent meningitis. Now, most of us think of meningitis <clears throat> as a bacterial meningitis that it can actually be fatal within a day or, or so. But there's another type of meningitis, which is viral meningitis too, which <clears throat> can be equally as bad, uh, but you don't culture anything because it's really hard to culture viruses. 
In any event, he had significant problems with recurrent terrible headaches that became so uh, bad uh, that they reduced him to a wheelchair at the time when he had these episodes. And he probably had about 20 of these episodes over a few years, including going to the emergency room and getting spinal taps and finding out that there, were, <clears throat> there was no infection there. Well, it turns out that he didn't have an infection. What he had was auto-inflammation. And it, this was on a genetic basis. We found that he had on exome analysis, a mutation in NLRP3, which is already associated with anti-inflammatory disease, but that was a systemic anti-inflammatory disease. This man had it only in his uh, central nervous system. And we considered that it was gain of function. And in fact, it really was gain of function. The NLRP3 inflammasome consists of a whole bunch of different proteins put together whose job it is to stimulate an inflammatory response by converting pro-interleukin-1 beta to active interleukin-1 beta. In this case, this one protein was, um, had a gain of function. It was like always on, causing increased inflammation. So there was increased conversion and more inflammation in this uh, individual. So we treated with an IL-1 receptor inhibitor called Anakinra. And when I saw him in the morning, he was in a wheelchair. When I saw him at noon, a few hours later, he was walking and talking normally because the inflammation had been taken care of. Here's a three-year-old boy who came to us and Dr. Tiff and Dr. And Priscilla D'Souza, the pediatric nurse practitioner, with incredible irritability and aggressiveness and injurious behavior. He also had developmental delays and a large uh, head. <clears throat> well, we have a special program where we get consultants from a pediatric uh, neurological radiologist who found the copper beaten skull here as a sign of craniosynostosis, basically failure of the sutures of the skull to um, uh, actually premature uh, suture closure of the skull so there isn't enough room for the brain to grow. And in his frontal lobes here, you see this little spot there? That's his frontal lobe herniating into his orbit. He had so much pressure inside his brain that he could not um, be relaxed. He was always um, in pain. Referred him to <clears throat> the world expert in the surgery of craniosynostosis, Dr. Goldrich, Goldrich, Goodrich, who performed an operation for him and relieved all of that uh, pressure. Dr. Goodrich died in 2020 of COVID. <clears throat> then we see Dr. Arian Soldatis, a member of our group, who had a 20 year old patient with progressive dystonia and had problems early with toe walking and declining speech and was clumsy, treated <clears throat> with uh, baclofen uh, for this lost her ability to write. I think the best thing I can do is to show you what she looked like early. And here she is lying in bed with her terrible posture because her muscles are holding her this way. She has normal intelligence and she's pointing out the things. She's learning what a parallelogram is, for example. And so What's your favorite Taylor Swift song? She can't speak because of her dystonia. Do you belong to me? Is that it? Is she in here with me? No, I don't. I'm not sure. She was going to do W-I. Oh, is it with me? Do you belong with me? That makes more sense. What's your favorite? Well, we found out that she had a de novo, a new mutation in KMT2B. And because of our previous work with this uh, gene and with our collaborators, we knew that deep brain stimulation might be helpful. So Dr. Soldatus arranged for that. And indeed, it was helpful. She was able to walk after deep brain stimulation. And I think for those of us who see patients who are incredibly impaired, we recognize that even a small increment in uh, activities of daily living makes an enormous 
impact on a family and an individual with that impairment. The ability to walk and you know, with, with some help is uh, an absolutely incredible advancement for this young lady. But we're not always that successful. We saw a 16 year old boy who had essentially problems with uh, the medium sized arteries with vascular insufficiency and primarily affecting his gut. It was fibromuscular dysplasia and he died. His mother sent us this note, which I'm just gonna let you read. And here's another case of a young man who played football. He had lost 60 pounds. We didn't make a diagnosis. Turns out he had intestinal lymphoma of which he died after he received a bone marrow transplant of the complications. And <clears throat> in his Bible, which he carried around, he kept this poem, which, I'm oh, sorry, which just, again, I'm gonna let you read because it's difficult to read. He did this to give him strength. A couple other stories, <clears throat> 52 year old woman who had this increase in her muscle mass without taking steroids or growth hormone, without working out incredibly, and she had an electromyogram that showed that she was myopathic. So it was a muscle issue. She had a normal muscle biopsy. You can see the muscles here bulging out from her um, spinal uh, cord. And we were aggressive enough to get a second muscle biopsy. And that muscle biopsy showed Congo red staining within the vessels. Congo red staining was an indication that she might have amyloid. And one of the common causes of amyloid is multiple myeloma. So we did a bone marrow. She did have 10% plasma cells, an indication of multiple myeloma. And in fact, at the time, she had involvement of the atrium of her heart. If she had gone a few more months with uh, involvement of the ventricles of her heart, it would have been irreversible and she would have died. But we referred her to the Mayo Clinic, which has an amyloidosis uh, center. She underwent a stem cell transplant in 2009, had a rocky course, but came back and did well after that and has not had a recurrence of the multiple myeloma. And she sends me a note, oh, I'm sorry. She sends me a note <clears throat> and this was the one after her bone marrow uh, stem cell transplant. And uh, perhaps the final story of this uh, patient was a 16 year old athlete that we, know, we never really saw, but one of our UDP um, internists, Dr. Donna Novacic uh, examined the records. There was a bone marrow uh, that was equivocal and it the patient was seen and the bone marrow was seen at three major medical centers. Dr. Novacic discussed this with the local physicians and obtained unstained slides of the bone marrow for our world famous expert, Dr. Elaine Jaffe, to do special saints to see if it was uh, really lymphoma. And uh, she thought it was because it had the appropriate markers. Uh, a repeat bone marrow biopsy was done, definitively making the diagnosis. And this young man was treated with chemotherapy. He had bone lymphoma, and he was treated before the terminal progression could occur. And here's a picture, and this is what his mom said to us. Of course, it doesn't always work out so well. I mean, we've probably had about 200 individuals who have died prematurely of their disorder. Um, 
And there are a lot of patients that we don't diagnose properly. But the successes allowed us to receive some awards and get a lot of publicity. And that's what the press has done for us. And there you can see some of the listings here. And I'll show you some of the pictures where uh, people interviewed us here and then did stories. And there was an award from the American Medical Association, et cetera. I think you know this guy, Scott Kelly, I think it is. And this People Magazine, et cetera. And uh, some other awards. The point being that all of this publicity allowed us to have the NIH and other entities back us enormously. It, it was uh, the reason why we could expand to a to an undiagnosed diseases network. And the first phase of this, the first five years, involved seven clinical sites, a coordinating center, a couple of sequencing cores. Um, metabolomics core, model organisms core, a central IRB, et cetera, and uh, the ability to share data with other individuals. The first patient was seen in August of 2015. And this is where some of those centers were for the first five years. And then after that, there was uh, the second four or five years involved uh, another uh, four sites maybe five sites, uh, with the same support. And that program has seen over 6,000 applications and, and seen uh, almost 2,400 individuals and made 600 diagnoses. So that's, that's pretty good. This is a signature program of the National Institutes of Health, and it's recognized as such because of what the press did for us, and somewhat because of what um, the diagnosis that we made and the new diseases that we discovered. And because of all of this, the NIH Institute directors are going to continue support in fiscal year 23 and beyond. And the intramural program here at the NIH will be part of a national program that uh, is going to be a little bit smaller, but will um, continue to exist. There's also been global expansion. Here you see in the middle uh, the first program here at the NIH and then a bunch of other programs around the country and then a bunch of other undiagnosed disease programs established largely by the governments of these different countries. And there is an undiagnosed diseases network international now founded in 2014 that has had several meetings as well as uh, data sharing policies, best practices, etc and a website, and a logo, and a mission. A mission to help bring diagnoses to individuals who don't have it, especially in underdeveloped countries. So we have that uh, website for uh, dissemination of information. There's a diagnostics working group that has been established and is now preparing to provide a forum for investigators who study rare diseases to provide information and consultations to centers around the world, especially in developing nations that don't have all of those resources. There's also a developing nations working group. This is the representation in the diagnostics working group. So a lot of different countries involved. And the aims are to help individuals receive a diagnosis to provide some equity of access is that's a really a difficult issue to support the families involved and to train clinicians so that there can be an expansion of um, delivery of diagnoses and subsequently treatment for some of the uh, individuals involved. Uh, and there would be the local team that would handle the clinical management, but could get some advice from uh, world experts. Again, the Developing Nations Working Group has representatives around the world and members throughout the world. And this is to comply with and live up to the aspirations of the United Nations. The United Nations General Assembly recently made a resolution on people living with rare diseases that recommended that international collaborations leave no person with a rare disease behind. And so, encourage the development of legislation and regulation and policies and actions to uh, prevent that from happening. 
So we want to partner with colleagues and UDPs throughout the world in order to achieve this. Now, part of that is a recent establishment of a champions program, which is essentially to create individuals in a few select underdeveloped countries that will have undiagnosed disease programs with in-kind and sometimes financial assistance from members of the Undiagnosed Diseases Network International and the Wilhelm Foundation. And we've identified four such local physicians in the Congo, Ghana, Pakistan, and Mali. And we actually had a meeting this morning from uh, eight to nine over this champions program. This is one of many meetings that we've had. And uh, the plan is to have expert consultations with members of the Undiagnosed Diseases Network International. There are a couple of sites that are willing to provide sequencing and analysis and possibly some equipment to these uh, centers, to the champions within those countries. Training in a genetics lab, actually Dr. Olaf Bodemer's lab at Harvard has agreed to bring people in from those countries that have the champions and to provide a clearinghouse to connect givers and receivers. That is the goal of the Undiagnosed Diseases Network International, which will meet and discuss this at the next meeting, which is in Vienna, November 7th and 8th of this year. We're getting some support from companies and um, expect to, uh, to seek philanthropy from certain sources, which uh, is difficult, but often requires just a pilot. In other words, a demonstration that we can use the money properly. And so we're working on that. The Champions Initiative is a consortium with stellar clinical ambassadors, the champions in low and middle income countries with a passion for helping meet unmet diagnostic and therapeutic needs. And it's supported by the UDNI and the Wilhelm Foundation. <clears throat> and it's especially designed for low and middle income uh, countries. I really love this picture of this young lady because her eyes are just so beautiful. And with that, I'll just leave you with the, the final picture that our goal in the Undiagnosed Disease Program and in undiagnosed disease programs throughout the world is to lend a hand to individuals who need a diagnosis as an entree to a community of individuals that share their problems and their medical issues and possibly as an entree to therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. I am absolutely speechless, Dr. Gall. Uh, that was uh, probably one of the more powerful presentations I've seen in the past few months of me um, investigating this issue and speaking with people like you. Uh, it leads me to the question that I, I promised you I'd ask you, and that <clears throat> is, because it's called the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, I'm wondering if that signals the fact that there's possibly explanation exponentially more uh, incidents of rare disease than we know of, simply because we know the estimate is 10,000 or so. Um, are there twice as many more that we don't know about? You know, in a way, th that question requires a definition of what a, a unique undiagnosed disease is. You know, there are, there are variations. We are uh, continuing to expand the phenotypes of particular genetic diseases. So there can be milder ones and more severe ones. <clears throat> the host asks you to start to read, okay. So we can do, um, there are different <clears throat> extents of disease. So I would say that uh, we know that there are 23,000 human genes. Theoretically, each of those genes can be associated with a human disease. Theoretically, each of those genes can be associated with several human diseases. We certainly know that there's precedent for that. But it's also possible that some of those genes will not be associated with human diseases because they're not, the mutations in them are not compatible with life. Some diseases that, that some genes are not compatible with life. So if I had to guess, I would guess that there's not, uh, let's say 10 times as many uh, genes as we know now. In other words, probably not, uh, not uh, 70,000 diseases 
but they're probably a lot more than 7,000. We have a question from fellow Hawken Miller. Hawken. Dr. Gall, first off, I mean, I agree with Rachel. That presentation was pretty incredible to see just the progress that some of these patients have made just with a, a treatment. And, you know, something that I'm working on uh, with my stories talking about um, the use of data, biorepositories, patient registries, and how that could be leveraged to, you know, make new discoveries, find, you know, new diagnoses and, and such. And, you know, something that I saw in your presentation was talking about you found um, ALS with the SOD1 um, mutation. And I'm curious, with more data, with more registries, how can you make that, you know, shareable and more interoperable among all these different stakeholders so that, you know, for example, to make the whole process of finding a diagnosis faster before, you know, people, people die from these conditions? Well, this is an issue of data sharing. And <clears throat> there are also, there are already many data sharing platforms for this. Know, a gene matcher, etc. But uh, there's probably a paucity worldwide of such data sharing. And I think the first step towards that is the Undiagnosed Diseases Network International, its website, its data sharing policies, and the fact that we have these meetings, and, and now the initiation of the uh, Diagnostic Working Group. So um, people have to want to share data. And we want to share data and uh, we're making it available, but then people have to get on to those websites as well. So the other element of this is proselytizing and making people aware that there are these sites. And that's you know, one reason why I was really anxious to give this talk because the press is the catalyst for this. It's incredibly important, uh, your, your role. So that, I, I think that's the answer that I would give. And I just want to ask, you can see me now, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, let's presume that's a good thing. So I noted that uh, you say you're having conversations with countries like uh, Mali and Ghana and Congo. Uh, and we have a fellow actually from, from Ghana, and I'm hoping that this will uh, spark her interest to sort of look into that. But I'm I'm just wondering um, how we can bring this to scale, particularly on the African continent with the H3 Africa initiative. There's been a lot of uh, sort of infrastructure work done to begin the, the foundation for genomic research. So how do we, we does it, will it require a sort of uh, double teaming of advocacy and research sort of working together to push this to the front of the agenda? Yes, I think that that's very true. We, we, we need that. But <clears throat> I'd uh, point out that we can have grand ambitions and make a plan from the top down uh, to, uh, uh, let's say, have large agencies uh, advertise and plan, et, et cetera. And that really is our goal. But sometimes, and I give as an example, the undiagnosed disease program, you can start out with a very small amount and show by example that things work and then people will pick it up. The UDP started with $280,000 that Steve Groft gave me to hire two nurse practitioners and a scheduler. And after the press got a hold of it and Dr. Zerhouni uh, you know, presented it, we got all sorts of people applying, et cetera. It was, so we started small. If I had asked for the amount of money that we subsequently got from the common fund to run the undiagnosed diseases network, if I had asked for that, I would have zero chance of getting it. Absolutely zero. There's no question in my mind. So I, I think that I'm still, we're still taking the tact that if the undiagnosed diseases network international demonstrates that champions in a few countries can create undiagnosed diseases program, that will be picked up upon and supported in, in a much broader fashion. We have a question from Juana Despa. Yes, yeah, somehow uh, 
you already answered to my question. My question was relating how we convince the government to invest in uh, uh, such a program. And uh, how many people do you consider that uh, will be saved if we, we will have uh, such a program on an, on an international scale? I'm thinking about Romania, for example, where we don't have this such a program. Well, for your first question is about the government involvement. I think that uh, many of those countries that currently have undiagnosed diseases programs established them after a UDP representative went there, gave a talk about it, and the host in that country had invited government officials. So when they heard about it and they wanted really in a way the prestige, but also the uh, public health benefits of having an undiagnosed disease program, that's what uh, stimulated the government officials to uh, establish that. In terms of how many people we're going to save, you, you know, when people like me give talks like this, we try to have some balance. I told you how many patients we missed, et cetera, and how many died, and I showed you some of the really good examples, et cetera. Those are the best examples, but it's, it's true that practically every patient or every individual who came to our undiagnosed diseases program, almost all of them, got enormous benefit from it, even if it wasn't life-saving. And that benefit is having a community, having a diagnosis, not being suspected by their colleagues and their um, friends and their family of making it up, et cetera. So that feeling of having you know, gone the distance and um, acquired a, a diagnosis or at least tried as best they could, th that feeling is an enormous uh, ancillary benefit, even if the patient uh, does not you know, have a life-saving treatment. We can take one more question and uh, let's hear from Shiraz Haznad from Pakistan. I, I can read it. It's one of the reasons for picking just four developing countries, including Pakistan. Well, it's exactly what I just said. Uh, in other words, starting where we can provide examples. If we pick 20 countries, we would probably be doing much less in every one of those countries and could not claim success because we have limited resources uh, you know, in, in terms of in-kind and financial resources. So that really uh, is the reason. And the second part of that is having someone already that we knew was working on undiagnosed disease and, and rare disease patients in that country. This session has taken my breath away. Um, and we actually have a, a one journalist who says, um, wonders if they can recommend patients. I would encourage each of you journalists in this fellowship to stay in close contact with the Undiagnosed Disease Network. I think our, our classic journalism training has us looking for the, the road less traveled or, or asking the questions, the ultimate question, why is it happening? Why isn't it being responded to, et cetera? And Dr. Gall, you have given us a tremendous amount of uh, information and context to consider this issue. And we're very grateful for you joining us and hope you will stay open to outreaches from the fellows in the program. I am, and I will just say, uh, we accept patients from abroad. So Helen, there's your answer. So Dr. William Gall, thank you again, and we'll be in touch. Thank you.